Hey, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Rachel Paling, author of Brain Friendly Language Learning and founder of Neuro Heart Education Foundation. Rachel, how are you today? I'm very well. Travis, thank you. And you? I am less than optimal, but still here and excited to talk to you. And that's all I matter. There's no other time than now is what I hear. That's right. Absolutely no other time than now. Give our listeners a little rundown of what it is that you do and who you are, Rachel. Um, Percy Travis, thank you for allowing me this space, time, moment together with you and with the listeners. Um, I principally, I, I dedicate my life to training educators. And the passion that I have around that is really how to help educators to use coaching as a vehicle of communication, use the neuroscience as a tool to help others and to, for us also to understand how the brain functions, how the brain learns, how the brain reacts, and especially in the learning environment. And what we as educators can do to maximize, optimize the learning process, whether it's for children, for adults, teenagers, everybody. Imagine you've done quite an extensive research in the realm of education. What are some things that you like about the current education model? And then I'm sure we'll spend a lot of time on things that you don't like about the current education model. Um, you know, worldwide, I think there is a, a sort of a trend of educators adapting to their learners. So I think no matter what model there is in all of the countries, what you really witness is teachers trying to break out, not because they want to go against the systems or the models, but because they want to come into the learners because the learners of today are different. And I think we can really appreciate that, yes, we are all different. You know, technology has changed us. Mobile phones have changed us. Life circumstances have changed us. Pandemic has changed us. And teachers are, are, it's almost like they are having to morph into something that they don't really understand what it is, but they're doing it intuitively. So I think that's what I love about today's educational outlook. Yeah, it's it's interesting how uh, things have been changing dynamically. And then with COVID, I'm sure everyone just excited for another COVID update, um, learning online and changing the way that we're doing business. But, you know, education is traditionally really only focused on two of the eight types of intelligence on logic, mathematical or linguistics, which is just fine, but you're only hitting a quarter of the people if it's divided evenly. And then they deliver primarily in lecture which is about 10% of how people learn. About half is kinesthetic, about 40% is visual, but they went with lecture, which is about 10%. So if you get 10% of the ways people receive it, but you're only catering to 25%, that means you're really only delivering two and a half percent to the way people learn and the things that they're focused on learning. It yeah. is surprising that we've even got this far. When I look at the education system, in general, uh, you know, it was a response to the industrial revolution and really needing people capable of working in the factory. Well, that was like 1890s. And we haven't really changed the model as a, as a big swath since I'm sure there's pockets that have changed the education model, but you yeah. really have a heart towards teaching the teachers. That's right. How do you, how right. do you get that heart? How did you get to that, that place? I'm being an educator myself. So at the age of 17, I started teaching um, English. I moved to Spain and I was thrown into a new world, into a new sort of um, position, into that sort of, oh goodness, what do I do? How do I do this? So it was a learning by doing job. And then through the years honing and, and developing the skills, um, I did many, many things, um, but teaching has always, through my life, teaching languages has always been in the background. Um, I was studying and teaching, 
the same time. And then after I studied, instead of becoming a lawyer and doing that, I then went on to teaching legal English and, and actually business English and then dedicating my life to that from the year 2003 onwards. And that training and development also then led me into coaching, it led me into neuroscience, it led me into how the brain learns with languages principally at the beginning. So that, that's how I came into to being fascinated about the learning process. How do we help people to learn? It's very interesting. And you do neuro language coaching. Is that um, similar to neuro linguistic programming? Absolutely, totally different. Good. <laughs> yes. I was reading through some of the, the materials ahead of time and I'm like, I wonder if it's like this. So what is, what is neuro language coaching? We are using firstly the coaching communication and the professionalism from the coaching world. We are accredited by the ICF with our programs. So we're taking the structure from coaching, the conversations from coaching, um, the ethics, the guidelines, all of that, bringing that into the teaching process, the goal setting, the action setting, the motivation, the commitment, all of that. And the essence of the sports coach, you know, the person who's accompanying you, tapping into your potential, and instead of slamming you down or, or not listening to you, you know, teachers have a tendency when you say, oh, I can't do this, they have a tendency of not listening and overriding and saying, oh, yes, you can, I know you can. This is something that we have to change. We have to start listening to learners and saying, look, I'm really sorry that you feel this way. What do we need to do to get you there? That's the coach. So that sort of spirit of coaching coming in. And on the other side, we incorporate the neuroscience and we do it from different perspectives. We bring it in firstly with metacognition. That's about the awareness, the awareness of what's happening when and how to enhance what's happening when and the reasons it's happening and, and understanding becoming aware of ourselves and when we are aware we can also bring the awareness for learners to become aware additionally it's about talking to learners about what is happening you know sharing about neuroplasticity neurogenesis how the brain can change how the brain learns how the brain learns effectively but also how everybody is different so we need to understand what works for that learner sitting in front of us. And it may be totally different to what works for you or me. Oh, absolutely. I know that I'm pretty high on logic and math, but I'm not very high on linguistics, which is kind of surprising uh, when people tell me they're like, really, that's not your strong point? No, really interpersonal skills is, is my strong point. And then I'm pretty high on visual, but a close, close second in um, auditory. So it's been very helpful for me in my school career and not very helpful for other people. Like my daughter very much struggled with the, the style of teaching in the public school system here in America. Hmm. You mentioned something that I wanted to highlight a little bit more. You mentioned neuroplasticity. And I'm just going to go ahead and assume that some of my readers have no idea what you're talking about. What is neuroplasticity? It really is the ability of the brain to change structurally and or functionally. So, you know, I'm older than you are. And many of the listeners may be of my era or even older. And I did grow up thinking that the brain could not change. So when I was a little girl and all through those early years, there was this feeling of, okay, that's what you were born with. That's it, that's your lot. When you get to a certain age, it will go into a decline. And as we say in England, Bob's your uncle and that's it, that's life. Right. Um, but now, and, and since the 1970s, we know that the brain can change. We know that we can change um, habits, we can change uh, and create new neural pathways. 
Um, we can change behaviors. We can change so many things. Now, there could be changes due to injury, illness, but there could also be self-directed neuroplasticity where we are creating those changes. For example, the habit of meditating every day and meditation with the studies, Harvard studies, we have demonstrations that absolutely there are areas of the brain that increase in gray matter, prefrontal cortex, hippocampal reason, and reason, uh, region, and even the amygdala, the little panic button that we have, um, shrinks. So meditation absolutely impacts the, the structure of the brain as well. Oh, absolutely. I was at a conference listening to Dr. Caroline Leaf, and she was talking about dendrites and neural pathways, and she was trying to put it in a, in a fashion that even I could understand. And she was talking about neural pathways and walking, walking in the country, and you eventually take the same path over and over again, because it's the shortest, shortest path. And what happens is you end up wearing kind of a trail into the grass. And if you look at that like a neural pathway, the more you use that pathway, the more robust it gets. And then if you That's stop right. using that pathway, the grass eventually grows over the path and yeah. it's, it's there, but you can't really, can't really see it. It's not as strong as it used to be. Yeah. And, you know, when explaining some of these concepts and learning about it and realizing that what you have, now you may be more inclined one way or the other, you may have certain types of intelligence that mean a lot more to you. You, know, you might be more musically inclined or intrapersonal or interpersonal or whatever you may have, but understanding where you're inclined and then understanding how to reinforce the areas that you're really strong at, that has a huge difference and a huge impact on people's lives. Absolutely. And, you know, I think we are still living in societies where beliefs take over our brain. And I actually think that worldwide, we are not living neuroplasticity enough. You know, we think we get to a certain age and we should be doing this, we should be doing that, we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be doing that. You know, this, this then, as you said, it makes us close down that, that root in the forest. And we stop doing that and we stop doing that. And, and this is where, yes, you do get that sort of decline. And it should be the opposite. We should be really encouraging to do things. You know, one of the best things we can do as we get older is learn a language. It's like a brain gym, code switching. We're really activating you know, areas of the brain that are keeping the brain active and going. They did a study on, on super ages, people that reached their 90s with phenomenal brains. And the study was really centered upon what is it that these 90-year-olds are doing to get these brains that they've got, which are sometimes better than brains of 50-year-olds. And they really discovered there are certain things, mental exercise, physical exercise, and social connections were the three top, let's say, pointers to their brain health. So learning a language is great as we get older. Dancing is phenomenal because you're using physical and mental at the same time. Best thing to do as we get older, dance. Oh, I love it. What does it look like to be part of your program if you are a teacher? A lot of teachers, when they end the program with me, they do say that it is a transformational program. It's a life transformation. You know, it's not only about us understanding learners, firstly, it's about us understanding ourselves and understanding the impact. You know, everything that we say as an educator has an impact on the learner, everything. Mm -hmm. So becoming consciously aware that if I say something this way, 
it could have an effect. If I say something another way, it could have a different effect. And how do I manage and control my communication in such a way that I can make it positive, dopamine inducing, um, let's say getting them into what I call the right learning state and provoking an impacting learning process. So I do think teachers firstly are impacted by the fact that they have to go very much into themselves to understand how to bring in that metacognition and awareness. Secondly, they discover about the brain. You know, many of us have been educators for many years. And I even had one person before he did the program, he said, why are you talking about the brain? And my answer was, isn't it time that we did? <laughs> I've gone through so many years of my life. You know, if I knew then, Travis, what I know now about my brain, wow. And I actually feel now at this age, um, so I'm over half a century old. I'll let the listeners work that one out. <laughs> I now feel that I'm in control. I'm, I'm at peace with my brain. And the Tibetans do say, you know, the brain is like a wild horse. You either take the reins, sit in the saddle and steer and control it, or it's going to be galloping in front of you and you're galloping behind. I actually think that for 40 years of my life, I was galloping behind my brain going, wait for me. Well, it's so yeah. easy to do, right? It's so easy to do. When you look, if you take a, a few moments and, and step back and look at society, I don't, I'm, I don't know if it's... Uh, different or similar to Spain right now. I'm sure you'll let me know, but there is a lot to do. You've got work. If you've got a family, if you've got children, you've got their school, their activities. You've yeah. got, if you want to stay up on politics, you're watching whatever kind of news you're trying to be involved in the community. And because there's so much going on, you don't hardly have time to have a real thought in your head. And you'd be like, oh, Travis, we have, you know, 50,000 thoughts a day or whatever the number is. And yeah, but they're not like real thoughts. They're like little blips on a radar that pop up. They have nothing to do with actual thinking, actual processing. It might be something you see triggers something else that you know, or it's something to do on a, a to-do list. Or, you know, like most politicians, if they can convince one side that the other side's trying to take something from them, then... It's like a magic trick. It's a sleight of hand trick. They're looking at each other instead of looking at what the uh, the quote unquote elected leaders are doing. And it's really easy to let your beliefs become your identity. So when something says somebody says something that doesn't align with your beliefs, you feel personally attacked because you've chosen that as your identity. And with all of this going on, it's a wonder we have time to think at all. As you say, the brain is busy. My brain, Travis, no lie, I have the quietest brain at the moment. It's heaven. Now I understand what you're saying because I had many years of the busy brain and the crazy brain and the thoughts kind of, oh, frenetic. But over these last years, understanding how to manage it, control it, shut it down if I need it to shut down and really saying, you know, okay, don't think about that, just stop. And having the power to be able to do that for me has been, you know, a seven, eight year journey of learning how to do that. And it's not easy. Now, if you can imagine, if we can give this to children, if we could bring this into the educational system so that children from a very early age are managing or understanding themselves, understanding when they go into a fight or flight, what to do, understanding if they're suddenly frightened of something or understanding if they are, I don't know, if they feel tired, what do they need? If their brain is like a jumpy brain, attention disorder, okay, what do I need to do? Mm -hmm. Just imagine if we could create a world where we're actually helping children from a very young age with very simple language to manage themselves. 
And this is where I say, if I knew then what I know now, I look back at my life and I go, oh, goodness, now I understand why I did this. Now I understand why I reacted here like that. Now I understand why I was emotionally out of order here. You know, I can look back and really see how amazing would it be that we could give that knowledge to children so they don't, they don't have to get to this age and look back. They can actually say, right, this is where I am now. And this is what I want my life to be. Absolutely. We, we often forget that we are not our thoughts and we are not our feelings. We right. are the person having those thoughts. Right. We are the person having those feelings. And, and they are a choice. Tell, they are a choice and we're in control. We can say, shut up. Our head is going crazy. We can Absolutely. control it and say, stop. Absolutely. I don't need to think about this. In fact, if we delay the vast majority of everything that we remember and we, we bring into our, our being is tied to an emotion. And when that emotion happens, that whatever that moment is, let's say um, I had something negative to say about you. Let's just say that's not true, right? I don't have anything negative to say about Rachel, but if someone tells me something and I have just a moment to say, is this person qualified to have this opinion? And is this true? If I can ask myself those two brief questions, are they qualified? Is it true? By the time I figure out the answer, the chance for that emotion to attach to the moment and wreck my day or wreck my week or wreck my life, that moment passes. All Absolutely. the information coming in, Absolutely. We, can, we can take those things that activate us and just just delay it just Absolutely. for a small moment. The person wow. handling all of our information inside our brain is like, well, this must not be important. There's no emotion attached to it. And it just ends up on the floor That's and right. not into our filing system that we're using to operate our lives on. If we That's can just right. delay it just for that moment. That's right. And that is metacognition. When we observe the trigger, mm -hmm. absolutely, we observe the trigger and we learn instead of reacting mm -hmm. to observe it and then choose. Yep. Yeah. So beautifully said, Travis. Absolutely. I was, I was, um, having a discussion out in Baltimore a few weeks ago, and we were talking about all my favorite topics, all sorts of political stuff. I love having these conversations if both sides are willing to listen. And I did my time. I did my listening time. About three hours into it, I finally had something I'd like to say. And I didn't agree with eh, more than half of the things that she had to say, but I was willing to listen. And I finally spoke up and said something. And she got very upset, freaked out. And I was like, hey, look, I've been listening to you and all of your opinions and all of your thoughts and all these things for more than three hours. And the first time I open my mouth, I'm not allowed to talk because of my gender. And she's like, her eyes went crazy and her face was getting mad. I was like, if we suppress people's opinions based on their experiences or based on their gender, like we haven't gotten anywhere in society. Yeah. Like I was fully willing to listen to all the things you had to say, whether or not you were qualified to have those opinions or not. I wanted to know where you came from. I want to know how you got to that opinion, because if I don't have the same opinion as you, did I miss something? Is there something I need to learn or understand? How did you get there? Is there something I can learn from you? And when yeah. I go into a discussion like that, I feel like there's a lot to gain, but it only works if both people are willing to listen, understanding that we have different backgrounds, different perspectives, ways we got to the point that we are now. Absolutely. There's you mentioned you mentioned should earlier. Should is a is almost a dirty word. I should do this, I should do that, I should do that, I should, should, should. You're about, about to should your pants is what you're doing. And there's no way you you're, um, you know, more experienced than I am, but there's some things that I've arrived at sooner than you. And there's things that you've arrived at sooner than me. And there's no, there's no right or wrong way to get to these things, but just because I'm, you know, 40 doesn't mean I have all the answers and it doesn't mean I know nothing. It doesn't mean anything. 
It just means that's how many clocks around the sun that I have. And honestly, you know, both of us could be sitting there with our perspectives and a 20 year old may come in with a totally different perspective that is absolutely really different to both mm -hmm. of our philosophy or outlook in life. And, you, you know, when, and again, coming to, to the teachers on the course, I say to them right from the beginning, in coaching, there's no right or wrong. Because when we are with a learner, when we're coaching, it's about adapting to that learner because they may have a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about all of these kids that were not reaching in the classroom, this is the problem that we have one educator with one way of delivery, but not reaching all those different perspectives all those different brains and how they interpret information. Absolutely. For those of you watching and wondering why I'm looking down, I've got puppies, <laughs> yes. I've got puppies running around under my chair wanting to say hello. Hi, Dad. How are you? Puppies. So how is, does this work in conjunction with the NeuroHeart Education Foundation? So... Uh, last year, we, we set up the NeuroHeart Education Foundation, and um, we're still getting this going and uh, still launching it out in the world. And yes, it's very, very much connected. So the, uh, the philosophy is bringing, again, the coaching and the neuroscience as those um, enhancing mechanisms into the learning process. The major difference is that the NeuroHeart Educational coaching training is for any teacher not only for language for any mathematics physics geography history and the real message is you know they are the experts in the material what we are doing is changing enhancing adapting the way to deliver that information and adapting it to the learners of today adjusting it to the 21st century delivery. That's the essence of the foundation. Now the foundation, when we really get it going, um, there will be also other courses coming in, which is for training teachers, um, how to help children with emotional management of, uh, you know, emotions, um, even yoga for kids, um, emotional intelligence, how to bring that in more. So there's going to be other training courses uh, available for teachers through the foundation and also homeschooling, remote schooling, and whatever, whatever else we can do to bring in as projects to help education, whether it's from the teacher training perspective, the learner's perspective, and hopefully from both perspectives. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. There's a lot of a lot of talk that I've heard recently that talks about, you know, if we can only reach children before they have their problems, before they turn into uh, broken people or broken adults, um, we would be a lot further ahead. I did AV, aviation maintenance for a long time, and they say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And you see things on the internet. I love the internet and I hate the internet all at the same time. Um, very specific point of view here, but they say, you know, if we had more Bibles in classrooms, then we have, then we would have less need to have Bibles in jails. I'm not saying Bible is or is not the answer, but it is so interesting how we able to see that in adults, but not in our children, because like I had children very young and you know, you're in your twenties trying to raise kids. You don't know anything about life yet. You hardly have a good relationship. You've got kids in the mix. And then when you have your second kid, oh, what, what did Jim Gaffigan say? He's like, imagine that you're drowning and someone tosses you a baby. That's what it's like to have more than one kid. And it's so true because we don't have hardly the time or the capacity to interject in children's lives where we can have the most impact to start them. I think all the research says that uh, kids are still building their operating systems roughly up until age seven. So all these 
intervention Sweet. programs that happen at teen or preteen years uh, miss the mark because their operating systems are created. So reaching children really in the early educational years, uh, K through two, and understanding things like health, mental health, feelings. It's okay to have a feeling. There's nothing wrong with anger. Yeah. If I take that anger and I focus it into my fist and I drive it into someone's face without being protective, like that is a problem. That action is not okay. But there's nothing wrong with anger. But if we don't ever learn how to process these things, if we don't ever learn just how important sleep is, just how important sleep is, just how important sleep is, then we, it doesn't matter these other things that we're teaching. That's great that you can do math, but if you're sleeping three hours a night, eventually you're going to lose your ability to solve problems. Not just math problems, but problems in your life. And when you go three weeks, four weeks, five weeks on this such little sleep, your life is going to be a train wreck and anyone that's attached to your life is going to feel the effects. But let's just not talk about that in schools, right? Well, this is the question. How do we start talking about this? Mm -hmm. That's the question. That's a real question. Why would you propose that? Because people with young kids are just swamped unless they already know this stuff. So reaching them, you don't have extra time to inject into the parents' life of young kids. And then you have educators, like what you're doing is probably the best way. They are adults. They have the capacity and depending on what their life looks like, they might even have the time. <laughs> you know, and eventually I think even bringing out programs for parents could be valuable as well, you know, and it's almost like now, may we say that we're at a crossroads in life, in, in humanity, if you like. And yes, we've got technology, we've got the computers, we've got the metaverse coming in. Fantastic. But we also have that question of how do we understand ourselves more? How do we? as adults, ch children, teenagers, take control of our brains and, and really learn how to manage ourselves. We have the information now. What's the reason that we're not doing it? it hasn't been prioritized. It hasn't been publicized. And it hasn't right. been practiced. Right. Many people are practicing now. But, you know, we're seeing more and more people using the information, using the research, bringing it. And this is obviously what we're doing to bring it to teachers. The other question is how to sort of be the bridge to the science, because a lot of teachers are terrified of the science. I think in 2015-16, there was a survey with US teachers. Uh, you know, we've had new education since the 1990s. What's the reason that you're not using it more and talking more about the brain? And many teachers actually replied because it's too complicated or it's scary. So how do we help teachers lose that fear about talking about the brain and, and just bringing it into very simple language, simple language for the, for the children, but also for the teachers to be able mm -hmm. to convey those messages across? Yeah, I think really familiarity is is the thing. Um, yes. You yeah. know, ten year ten years ago, Bitcoin was a thing, and right. I had lots of things to do in my career, and I chose not to get involved with things like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. And the first time someone was explaining it to me, and the second time someone tried to explain it to me, it just was too complicated. So I didn't take the time to get familiar with the subject matter. I prioritized different things in my life that I thought would have a greater impact on me. And I may or may not be correct, because if I had put 100 bucks into it or 200 bucks you know, 10 years ago, I might be singing a different tune today, right? So now we have things like NFTs that are coming up, non-fungible tokens. And you better believe old Travis has taken some time to learn about some of those things, even though it's a little bit scary because I don't want the next Bitcoin train to pass me by. 
not because, you know, it's within my zone of genius or it's the things that I care about, but some of these things that are coming up, they're going to have a huge impact on my life and everyone's life. And if we don't take the time to learn it, even though it's a little confusing and even though it's a little scary, yeah. those early experts are the ones that benefit the most. Think Absolutely. about it. Think about investing in a company. You yeah. know, when it goes public, you have some time to get some wins, but the people that were the big winners were in their second or first, second or third round of funding before the, the IPO. Those are the people that won massively. Yes. And it's because they learned early when it was too confusing for the general population. They're the ones that got in and learned it and applied it and did it and took the risk. And because yeah. you take the risk, you get the biggest reward. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we get the familiarity into teachers? Does this need to be um, a college course that is part of their teacher certification to get more familiar with it? Does it need to be two or three required courses in their teacher training? Uh, there's there's so much out there. And just dealing with uh, doctors over the last couple of weeks, even though you spend years going through college and pre-med and medical school and then eventually determining a specialty, just because you've chosen a specialty and you have a title like neurosurgeon does not mean the learning is over. There is mountains of knowledge left to learn within a specialty. So even with teachers, there is so much yet to learn just because you've been through school doesn't mean you're going to be a good teacher. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And, you know, I mean, it would be amazing if, if this were part of the teacher training package worldwide, you know, that they have to go through these modules of the coaching approach, how to change the way they communicate, how to troubleshoot and strategize with kids. Mm -hmm would be amazing, Travis. Yes. Troubleshoot and strategize. Absolutely. Yep. What would be your advice for anyone listening to this that's like, you know what, this is really interesting and I want to learn more. Where would you direct them? Well, I'm going to say to have a look at uh, all the work that we do. So www.neuroheartseducation.com and there there are the different sort of segments of, of what we do. Also, the New Heart Education Foundation.com. Um, we have an annual conference, which is coming up in April in Spain. And that is called the New Heart Education Conference. And it's the sixth one this year. And it will be there, the first one that we come back to some kind of normality of having real people attending the last two years have been online conferences and the conference as well is is shaped around that question how can we enhance learning how can we enhance the educational process and we have speakers from neuroscience um, coaching emotional intelligence practical intelligence even nlp we have a lady coming to talk about nlp and so it, you know, it's about educators being creative and saying, okay, there are things that we're learning that can be some tips and, and information of how to handle certain situations in the classroom or how to, how to help coach kids in some situation or how to enhance attention, how to enhance imprinting. And the more that we can do that, the more that we are going to be showing children the optimal ways of learning, not wasting time, you know. And, and I think we're in a world where nobody wants to waste time anymore. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Um, recently have been watching a few TV series and uh, uh, really, I rewatched Longmire again. It's just... Uh, a sheriff show and they have the Cheyenne nation nearby and there's a lot of back and forth between the two, but I like the show, not because it's a cop show, not because of the things they do, but because the way that he handles the, the dynamics between the County and the tribe and then the leadership and discernment he uses. My wife is trying to get me to watch. Uh, she got me to watch vampire diaries and trying to get me to, to slog through the originals and although there's interesting things in there, like it doesn't, it doesn't like get me going. It doesn't engage me intellectually. 
I'm not big on drama and backstabbing and stuff. So like, it has no draw for me. So she's like, although, uh, although I love spending time with my wife, she's like, let's watch this. And I'm like, Oh God, really? No, can we not? And not because it's not a good program, but because it doesn't have anything that's going to feed me. It doesn't, it's not going to draw my, my attention, attention. It's just going to be background noise and understanding the things that we really do throughout our day that have the biggest impact. I was talking to a young man named Lamont and he started listening to the show and we were having morning discussions and I asked him and I was like, what does your day look like? He's like, he's like, Oh, busy. I was like, isn't that the biggest BS badge of honor busy? And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, how often do you have it have time in your day to actually think about something purposely on purpose, think about something. And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, you know, I wonder about the future. What might my future look like? And take just a few moments on your future. And he's like, he's like, I don't know if I've ever done that. I was like, well, then you might not have the time in the day, but I bet you, I bet you, you might have the time. It's like, what time do you need to be at work every day? And he's like, I've got a clock in at five 30. I was like, well, do you get to work right at five 30? Do you get to work a few minutes ahead of time? He's like, no, I get there between five and and 525. So sometimes I have a few minutes. I was like, when you get to the parking lot, is there a spring under your seat that just propels you out of the car into work, into the office? And he's like, no. I was like, but do you act like that? He's like, kinda. I was like, how about this? How about when you get to work or shoot, get to the grocery store, right? How long does it take to grocery shop? Nobody knows, right? There's, there's nobody knows how long it takes to grocery shop. It's like, when you get to where you're going, when you get to the office or you get to the grocery store, Take a few minutes in your car and just breathe. Maybe you listen to music. Maybe you like audiobooks. Maybe you listen to a podcast. I can recommend a good one. Or maybe you just take a few minutes for you and see how that impacts your day. And I had breakfast with him four or five days in a row. And he was like, I can't even begin to describe how just three minutes in my car makes me so much more calm throughout the day wow three minutes three minutes wow. not some specialized meditation program not downloading some app that's going to walk you through it just knowing that you don't have to jump out of your car the moment you get somewhere allows you to collect yourself and give yourself yeah. a little bit of space to just be you wow and that brings us to that statement that you said right at the beginning. There's no other moment than now. So when he arrives in his car, he is sitting in the now. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Right where he needs to be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you're living in the past, you're feeling guilty, depressed, or shamed. If you're living in the future, you're anxious or worried. But if you're living in the now, you're truly present. And that is the gift. It is. It really is. And, and living in the now with a calm brain. Yes. Even I do think so. Yeah. You know, I always say the only battle in life is with ourselves. Nothing else. It's something I heard recently, the only person on the earth that your subconscious knows exists is you. So people that you know that are spending time talking negatively about someone else, your inner self thinks you're talking about you. Goodness. Be nice to yourself. Say nice things. Even if someone gets on your nerves, instead of talking to yourself about it, maybe ask them what's going on in their world. That's right chances are you will find that they had no idea that they were being a pain in your side. And chances are they're suffering. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. Where can people get a hold of you, Rachel? They can drop me a line info at efficient language coaching.com. Uh, they can find me on Instagram, Rachel Marie Paling or new language coaching. They can find me on Facebook, Rachel Marie Payling, and also LinkedIn, Rachel Marie Payling. And I'm delighted, delighted if people want to connect 
um, delighted if they are interested in changing education, changing the way that we educate, train, coach, deliver knowledge. If you're listening to this program and you've been listening to other interviews that I've done and you've not reached out to the guests, I think you're living life wrong. Reach out to them, say hello, tell them that you like their talk or maybe you didn't like their talk. Maybe you want to talk bad about me behind my back. I don't know, but reach out to the guests, say hello, tell them what a great job they did. And as always, you can find more great discussions like this at nonprofitarchitect.org. Check out the great shows we have in the blog. I make a blog post for each and every episode that we do. And there's also some resources if you're wanting to get involved in podcasting. Rachel, thank you so much for being my guest today. Travis, thank you. It's been an honor.